Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Before I introduce you to such an exciting guest today, I have to give you all, I'm always talking about this is an explicit discussion. This is a little, you know, veering on the edge of homoerotic discussions. Everyone knows that I work on Whitman and queer theory and homoeroticism, and I like to talk about sex in the media. But when I say this is an explicit discussion, you all have been warned that this is our first ever discussion openly about gay pornography. And it's not going to be the last because eventually I want to have a gay porn pornography actor on in the industry because I think that would be a fascinating study. But let me introduce you to my guest who I just have such admiration for. Um, I use him in my dissertation and he wrote a book that I think is so foundational for anyone who's studying male homoeroticism. So I should have asked him first how to pronounce his last name, but I think I can get it. So Dr. Thomas Wo, or is Whoa. it Wu? Wo. 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 Okay. Oh, just like the uh, British writer. That's it. Okay. Dr. Thomas Wo, uh, who is a Canadian critic, is what his bio says. He is best known for his work on documentary film and eroticism. He really specializes on gay pornography, on eroticism in arts and culture. Um, I know that he's written, we're going to talk, get into his canon of writing, but it spans all the way from 1977 up until the present day. And he actually went to Columbia University for his PhD. I need to talk to him about that experience with the work that he does. Um, and he is the Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Film Studies and Interdisciplinary Studies in Sexuality. So yeah, without further ado, here is Thomas Waugh. <laughs> How are you, Thomas? I'm great. Hello, everyone. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Well, so I was talking to Thomas first. I think it's helpful for the audience and for me to learn as one of your devoted now fans. And, you know, I'll get into, he's already seen how he makes an appearance in my dissertation. But before we get into Hard to Imagine, which is the book that I have been teasing the audience with, which I think is just so foundational for anyone who looks into erotic art. And if you're going to look at male, male, same sex representation, in film and photography, your book is at the top. But before that, how did young Thomas, you know, make his way to Columbia? Like, was there, there this mission in your mind of, okay, I know that I need to study eroticism. Like there's something about this culture that just fascinates me. Like, how did that enter your mind? The path was a little bit circuitous. In the late 60s, I was an English major, and I was very impatient with that discipline. It was pretty stodgy. Uh, and uh, I loved the movies, and I didn't really know what to do. So after I finished my BA, we have something called CUSO in Canada, which is our version of the Peace Corps. And I said, I've got to get out of here. So I spent two years in India with CUSO teaching English in India, which they don't need because they have like 500 million English teachers who are un unemployed already in India, but whatever. So I was there for two years sort of looking for myself and during that time, I came out to myself fully as a gay man. I already knew it, but I decided to do something about it. And I also made a decision to drop English literature and move into film, film studies. So from over there, I applied to several places for graduate work including Colombia. Colombia was the only place that offered me money. So 
I grabbed it and I ended up in Columbia in 1972 for my Master of Fine Arts and then eventually my PhD. So I was four years in New York City. And if anyone wants to come out, New York City in 1972 is a pretty good choice. Wow. So 1972, you're there in New York City. And this is your first time ever in the States is when you went to Columbia? No. Um, I mean, Canadians very often have hol- take holidays, vacation in the States, or I think we'd gone to the beach in Maine once or twice. But, you know, this was the first serious immersion in American culture, and Manhattan's a good place to do that. Yeah. So, you know, do you miss that Manhattan culture now? Like, because I think you don't live in Manhattan no, um, I do a little bit. Um, it was very exciting. I established in four years, you establish friendship circles and intellectual communities and political communities. And when I got my tenure track job in Canada in 1976 in Montreal, I had to leave all that behind. So that was like a big displacement. But of course, I kept trying to keep in touch with everyone. And uh, I have very, very fond memories about those four years in Manhattan. Yeah, well, so let's get right into it, um, which is, you know, the work that you in nine, so 1972, you know, you're in Manhattan. What year did you get your Ph.D.? Was it 1972? No, um, I finished uh, my coursework in 76, wrote my comprehensives and I had to finish my this but in those days i was able to get a job without having a a final phd so i Mm -hmm. came up here uh thought i'd be able to finish my discs in a year or two but it took me five and it wasn't a queer topic at all it was a sort of a new lefty documentary topic Mm -hmm. and uh, i was sort of postponing the vision of doing something queer professionally in in film studies. And uh, as you mentioned, it really wasn't only until, uh, well, a little bit later that I started publishing on queer cinema. uh, And that was really an important shift. Yeah, well, a nice quick search on your Wikipedia shows, (laughs) you know, You have to question Wikipedia, but I feel like Wikipedia now is a pretty, you know, reliable source of publications. But so when I see that you published Who Are We? A Very Natural Thing, The Naked Civil Servant Films by Gays for Gays in 1977, was that your dissertation? No, no. Ah. What happened there was Jump Cut was a very important tabloid newsprintish new left film publication in the States. It was wonderful and I loved it. However, after I started reading it around 1974, they published a a critique of a film, a Clint Eastwood film. And the big heading, the title of the film was Tight Ass and Cocksucker or something really homophobic and I wrote them a letter saying what are you doing this is insane uh it's a stupid homophobic film but your review doesn't have to be homophobic um and they apologized and recruited me to write for them and they were very smart because here I was fresh talent uh waiting to write and there I did it so it was called films by gays for gays Mm. And I submitted it to them and they helped me the, in the editing process. It was wonderful. Um, but it wasn't specifically about eroticism. I think I was being a little bit coy. It was about maybe what you might call gay social social realism. One of those films was a documentary that you, we know by the title um, Word is Out now, which is like an epic the first gay lib, lesbian and gay lib document, uh, 
epic documentary from um i think it came out that year 78 can't remember exactly and so that film plus two uh fiction features one british the naked civil servant and one american a very natural thing so i did make comments on sexuality and eroticism but it wasn't the focus of the article so i was being a little bit coy uh sort of integrating those three films into the discipline of film studies uh in a legit film studies journal uh so that was my first big queer publication meanwhile i had been publishing uh gay film reviews in the body politic which was our sort of our radical political <laughs> monthly in Toronto, a gay uh, monthly. And uh, yeah, so I uh, published some critiques. And around that time, I had published uh, a review of a very erotic film by Derek Jarman called Sebastian. And it rubbed me the wrong way for some reason. Now I love it. <laughs> but I was very negative about it. And maybe it was a kind of symptomatic thing about being uh, provoked by its blatant eroticism. I don't know. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, the host and director of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I hope you're enjoying what you're watching on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So to watch the rest of the episode, head to our Patreon. It is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. That's Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And you can watch the rest of the episode on our $5 a month membership called ITBR Student or join the ITBR Professor membership. It's only $10 a month. You get access to all of our videos. You get access to both of our book clubs, the Ivory Tower Boiler Room and the True Crime and Academia Book Club. Plus, you unlock all of our other episodes. So at the ITBR Student, you only get access to our weekly interviews and the True Crime and Academia episodes for $10 a month, you get access to our ITBR rewatches, our teaches series, and True Crime and Academia rewatches and teaches series, plus the book clubs. Okay, I can't wait to see you all on Patreon. And just a reminder, I also offer consultation services. It is $30 for your initial consultation. You get a one hour private Zoom with me, and I will help you whether you want to create your own podcast and or media brand, you want to navigate academia as an undergrad or grad student, you need help with technology as it relates to teaching or media, do you want to expand your social media presence as an artist, writer, podcaster, or academic, or even crafting your public humanities identity? I will help you with my consultation services. You can also find that on Patreon as well. Okay. Thank you all for watching and for supporting the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Bye.